it's starting to gain momentum. And I wrote about this. I mentioned it. Uh, uh, I, I tweeted about it last night. I, there was a piece that came out on chapter and verse. If you subscribe, it's almost riot season. The left's new cause celeb. And that was, of course, discussing this Jordan Neely case. So if you're unfamiliar with this case, you're going to start hearing a lot about it. And you might have already seen some of the clips. A 30-year-old man named Jordan Neely was on the subway and he was put into a chokehold by a 24-year-old Marine. Now that headline alone sounds horrible, right? It sounds, oh my gosh, he was just, it sounds like he was targeted and murdered. But that's not the case. Uh, he And this was uh, in, this was on Monday, around 2.30 p.m. on Monday, said police. And, you know, people show the video without context, and they make it sound like it's George Floyd 2.0. In fact, the NAACP has already weighed in. BLM is already there. They want this Marine charged with murder. They said he was, I mean, if you read like Toure and some of these other people on MSNBC, CNN, they said that, oh my gosh, they act like this Marine just saw this black guy on the subway and wanted to kill him. Hold him accountable, they're demanding. He's, he killed just this innocent, fun-loving Michael Jackson impersonator. Hmm. Is that the full context, though? Because you can be sad that Jordan Neely died, that he died the way that he did without ignoring the fact that he also represented a credible threat to public safety. I mean, enough so that strangers felt compelled to step in. It wasn't just the Marine. The Marine got him in a chokehold. There were other people working to subdue this Neely guy. He had a history of being more than just a menace on the subway. AOC said, oh, he was just home. He was homeless and he was crying for food. Literally, that's what she said. And the murderer gets protected. Murderer. Now, by the way, Juan has the some of the footage if you watch the simulcast, so just a warning on that uh, from the subway. Neely had, like I said, he had a history of being more than just a menace on the subway. This guy had 44 prior arrests for offenses that included assault. And speaking of assault, he had a, a, a warrant out for his arrest at the time for felony assault. He had apparently, uh, he was apparently threatening other passengers. And he had tried previously, and this is all documented, tried pushing people onto the subway tracks. And he had viciously punched a 67-year-old woman in the face. This is all recent. He was described as a subway recidivist. ABC 7, New York. 44 prior arrests, including assault, disorderly conduct, and he was actively being sought for questioning, and this was the felony assault warrant. His uh, criminal record started in 2013 with petty crimes in the subway, but they said they got more serious over the years. So this is why it isn't irrational to think that he finally may have scared someone into thinking that they had to defend themselves by using force, which is also sad. It is sad that anyone was put in that position. It is sad that you can't even ride the subway without living in fear that you could be stabbed. No, by the way, where was all? Let me pull this up. Speaking of that, I have a story here of a gentleman who was killed in one of these situations. He was stabbed by a homeless person, much in, you know, a, a, much in a situation like this. I'm going to find this story. It's not be, I mean, it's, it's completely rational to think that, you know, finally, he may have scared someone into thinking that they had to use force to defend themselves, themselves and other people. And no one has a thought to spare for the people who, you know, they, I mean, it's sad that anyone was even, even put in this position in the first place. That's also sad. But like I said, he had, he had uh, a record. 
Unsafe Streets U.S. had the story of Tommy Bailey, a family man who worked as a union steam fitter, father of three children. He saw a homeless man harassing a New York police officer, told the man to stop. The homeless man who had a history of violence stabbed Bailey in the neck and killed him. There, were, there was nothing from these same politicians. AOC wasn't out here. No one called it a lynching. No one was talking about black men always getting stabbed. None of that. But in this case, because it was a white Marine, that's immediately the narrative that was used. And it's sad that anybody, it's sad that he died this way, and it's sad that he put people in the position to think that they had to use force to protect themselves and others. That's why I said it's not irrational to think that he finally may have scared someone. He had a violent history. Now, the local press has been very good about including this aspect of the story. The national press has predictably omitted it in favor of this George Floyd 2.0 narrative. Now, I said in my piece there are several issues at play here. Neely had a long history of terrorizing passengers. Whether it's from police reports or eyewitness accounts, his unchecked hostility created this ticking time bomb situation. I mean, every report said that his behavior was getting worse and worse, more and more violent. At some point, someone was going to believe that there existed a credible threat to their safety and they were going to have to defend themselves. Second thing, this is the post-George Floyd era. To assume that the individual, the Marine, put Neely in a chokehold because he was motivated by race is only possible if you view the world through that same lens of racial prejudice that you oppose. That the fact that multiple other passengers acted to assist in subduing Neely suggests that the Marine was not the only one who viewed Neely as a dangerous threat. The left, if they're so capable of immediately assuming the best of Neely and the worst of the guy who engaged him, why do they not also imagine the fear from the other passengers and the, and the witness described situation as being so tense that strangers felt compelled to intervene. Here's the other thing. Why does the left and the national press immediately give benefit of the doubt to a violent repeat offender and not the Marine with zero record except for one of service to his country? Three. As I said, Neely had a very long history of terrorizing passengers of all ethnicities. And Democrats like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, they want you to ignore this. She tweeted, quote, Jordan Neely was murdered. But because Jordan was houseless and crying for food in a time when the city is raising rents and stripping services to militarize itself while many in power demonize the poor, the murderer gets protected with passive headlines plus no charges. It's disgusting. That's a pretty heavy accusation from a sitting member of Congress to call someone a murderer. She wants you to ignore all of the context that I gave you and focus on class warfare. Neely was homeless, which is apparently a situation that affords someone the right to threaten and assault people without expectation of penalty. Or on, on uh, Neely's, they want you to focus on Neely's Michael Jackson impersonation videos. Like that's, that's, you know, there's nothing else. That's all he was right here. Just a harmless Michael Jackson impersonator. They want to promote the narrative that Neely was murdered, murdered for being poor and black. That's why they focus on this and they ignore his record. They ignore, like on the video, you can hear the guy screaming threats. Of course, you know, AOC also once said that people were looting in New York City for bread. They were going to like, you know, Foot Locker for bread. I don't know who she thinks is the demonized party here, but I'm inclined to think that it might be the people that Neely was terrorizing over the years. Like the 67-year-old woman who was punched in the face of the people he tried to push on the, those subway tracks. I, I'm inclined to think that those were the people who were demonized. I'm inclined to think that the people who felt that physical force was necessary to subdue him were the ones who were demonized. Now she rushes without any context 
to present this picture of a guy victimized by everyone and everything other than perhaps himself. New York City has a, an over $1 billion annual budget for mental health. And they have little to show for the previous efforts. Remember the Bill de Blasio thing? The uh, Thrive New York City? Remember how his wife just made a billion dollars just vanish in thin air? Where'd that money go? No, New York City has a billion dollar plus mental health budget that feeds people through the system, but it doesn't address the root issues. It doesn't address the breakdown of the family. It doesn't address the breakdown of the community. It doesn't address the breakdown of local support systems. These are localized networks that historically have been relied upon to be the first line of defense to identify when loved ones have problems, to aid loved ones with mental health struggles. But in our republic that we have now, in this social contract, the state should be the last ditch. But Democrats treat it as the first and only resource. That's the real victimization. Bad policy that has destroyed pillars of a successful community. Bad policy that has destroyed the family that has destroyed places of worship, that has destroyed neighborly kinship, and replaced them with this synthetic, if you want to call it that, support structure that doesn't do anything but create and encourage an over-reliance on government. 